Well, hi, everybody. It's time to get started. My name is Mike Connor, and we're going to talk today about bees and trees. And this is a low key group, so if you have any questions, feel free at any time to ask questions, and I'll try to come up with an answer for you. Now, who am I? For those who don't know, I am an arborist. That means I'm a tree specialist, a tree doctor. Um, we do lots of things with trees. We diagnose tree disease. I like to tell people that I'm a tree physician, not a tree mortician. And we, uh, we like to treat trees. I love trees. I've worked around trees all my life. So we try to keep trees uh, as a focal point of what we do. Uh, here we're actually treating a tree at a construction site where someone had parked bulldozers and heavy equipment over the tree, and the tree was dying. So. We were able to go in and we use an air spade and blow the soil loose around the, around the roots and rejuvenate the tree and the tree, I'm happy to say, recovered. Um, I'm also a, a, a nursery grower. We grow lots of uh, trees for bees and I'm a beekeeper. I've been a beekeeper since I was 12 years old and that's a lot of years. Uh, so. What we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about bees and trees, and it's really important for you to know, and what most people don't know is that in Michigan and the Midwest specifically, honeybee population depends upon trees. And I didn't realize how uninformed I was about the relationship between bees and trees, even though I was an arborist and a beekeeper and a nurseryman, until my wife and I were up at a farmer's market in a town I won't mention, and there was a guy selling honey. And I got talking to the guy and found out that he was a president of a beekeeping club, and he had free samples of honey, which is a good way to buy it. And I took a sample and I said, hey, this is really good basswood honey. And he said to me, I didn't know basswoods made honey. And I became aware that here a guy was getting his honey crop from trees and he didn't even know it. So I am kind of on a quest trying to inform beekeepers and arborists um, the necessity of maintaining trees and planting the proper trees for bee buildup and honey production. So trees provide the earliest and most abundant pollen and nectar resources. And that's very, very true. And on top of that, the largest potential nectar yield or honey crop per acre is from trees. And I know you won't believe that. You know, we look at, this is yellow sweet clover, great honey crop, right? Everybody likes yellow sweet clover. It's a native species. And there's white sweet clover, and people will plant that for bee forage. Again, it's a fantastic honey plant. But it will only produce it at its highest potential an acre of sweet clover can produce 200 pounds of honey. And that sounds great. That's fantastic. I can get 200 pounds of honey off of an acre of uh, sweet clover. Compare that to this tree. This is a linden tree, a basswood tree, which has a potential of 1,200 pounds of honey per acre. That's its potential. Doesn't mean you'll get 1,200 pounds. It means that that's what the potential is. Uh, put that into terms that we all understand. Two, just two, mature trees having an 80-foot span have the same potential as an acre of sweet clover. Now, which can you plant in your backyard? Can you plant an acre of sweet clover, or can you plant two trees? That is what I'm trying to get across to people. And if you have your choice of planting a basswood tree or planting a Norway maple, plant a basswood tree, you know? Uh, it's good for the pollinators, not just bees, but it's good for all the other pollinators. So that's an important, if you come back with nothing else from listening to me talk and ramble on, trees can produce as much nectar as, as wildflowers. Yes, sir? Did you say the American basswood is yes. also known as the linden? Yeah, um, basswood and linden terminology is interchangeable. Uh, we, have, we have lindens that are European lindens. We have silver lindens. We have American linden. They're all basswoods. Okay. And some of that terminology gets confused, but that, that's a good question. You know, in, a, in the U.S., we have a BB tree, which is Evodia, and in Europe, a BB tree is the uh, little leaf linden. So it's all terminology. This is a basswood flower in bloom. 
And I happened to take this photo while it was raining. And I don't think this photo, but there were bees working the basswood while it was raining. And what happens is the basswood flower hangs down and it's protected by leaves. So even in a rain, the, the nectar that's in the flower does not get diluted by the rain. Whereas other flowers that hang up, it rains and the nectar is diluted and it takes a while, several days, if at all, for that nectar to get back to concentrations where the bees will gather it. But basswoods don't. They hang down and uh, the bees find them very, very appealing. Now, here's a point, second point you need to walk away with. This is a photo I took of my bees March 23rd. Look at all the pollen that's coming in. And March 23rd, that's a full month. That's a month and a day before the first dandelions bloomed at my place. Before the first wildflower was in bloom, by a month, bees are bringing in pollen and by process of elimination, yellow pollen, when and looked, was coming off of willows, and this gray-green pollen was coming off of red maples. And real profuse uh, suppliers of pollen a full month before wildflowers are putting anything out. And in fact, when dandelions were in bloom, red maples were still blooming. That's not the same red maple that was in bloom the first of uh, this, this nectar flow, but genetically, they just kept blooming for five or six weeks. We're seeing that with catalpas now, by the way. And here's a photo I took of inside that hive, and you can see all the pollen that's inside. And most of it is from uh, red maples and from willow. Red maple in bloom at that time. Amazing the amount of blossoms that are on a red maple. If, if our bees were strong enough and the weather would cooperate, you could harvest a super of honey or two during the red maple flow. But because it's so early in the spring, we only get a day here, a day there, of uh, where the bees can really bring it in. But during that time, they will really bring it in. You can see it. That's the gray green, yes. Now this is willow, and this happens to be pussy willow, um, Salix capria, and that's a plant that likes to grow out in the swamps and the wastelands and the wetlands, and most people don't even know it's there. And what I've noticed when I show that pollen to people, they'll say, well, it came off dandelions. Well, this is a honeybee working dandelions, nice and yellow. In fact, I. I gave a talk down in uh, Indiana two years ago, and I, I made the claim that dandelion pollen is not yellow. And a guy showed me a photo of dandelion pollen, and it is indeed yellow. So I went out and took a photo. It is yellow, but it is also extremely dry, so the bee has to add nectar to it to make it stick to its leg, and it turns orange. If it's yellow pollen in the beehive, it is not dandelion. Dandelion pollen is so dry, they have to mix it with a liquid to get it back to the hive. Changes color. So I got educated from that. Willow, we have more than 400 willow species. They interbreed freely. Um, there's no such thing as a true weeping willow anymore. It's all hybridized out. I mean, it's bred with everything else. We have trees we call weeping willows, but they're not the true Babylon weeping willow that we started with. And all these willow species like to interbreed. So a taxonomist goes nuts when it comes to willows. So we have, we have over 400 species and probably thousands of hybrids. But the potential with a willow tree is to bring in 1,500 pounds of pollen per acre in the month of April. Yeah? Now how many trees would that be on? Uh, you know, that depends on the variety, but that's a good question because it's, it's a pretty simple mathematical procedure. Measure the square feet underneath the tree, and then how many trees does it take to fill an acre? 42,000 square feet. That's why that's the math that I did on the basswood, which was 80 square feet or 80 feet across, comes out to about 4,800 square feet per tree. And uh, because they do five times 
the amount of nectar, you know, the math just works out that two trees are the equivalent of an acre of sweet clover. Yes, sir? I have a pussy willow tree. Yeah. Actually, it was a bush, but we turned it into a tree. Yeah. It's about a quarter of the size of this room. Yeah. And if you stand in my backyard, and our bees come from a neighbor down the block, my backyard hums. We've yes. Picking it up, and it's the first part of March. And that wall, first part of March. First part of March. Thank you. Thank you. So the bees are. Where do you live? Chicago. Oh, Chicago. I'm in okay. The Okay, so you have a microclimate, which gains you probably 10 days. He's down a little further south, which gains him a few more days. So end of March, 1st of April, that's about right. Yep, good, good. Now, willow's tremendous, and willow's totally overlook species. We, we don't even pay any attention to willows out in the landscape, you know, especially in the swamps, because we don't go into the swamps. And this is a... You know, it's a weeping willow. They're pretty. They're a good landscape plant. I have a nice weeping willow in my yard, and I'll show a photo of it later. They're a messy tree, I understand, but you put them off in the back, and they're a beautiful tree. This is a pussy willow, and they can get quite large. Or it's a pussy willow hybrid. Nobody knows. Another one, this is growing uh, on my property down in the swamp. And the nice thing when they're bringing in pollen and nectar like that is there's so much coming in. Um, on the end of my hive tool, uh, what I'm trying to show is that I have fresh nectar the last week of March. Fresh nectar coming into the hive. Now, that's important to note. And again, a photo of bee walking in with pollen. I don't know if you know how bees do that. When a bee brings in nectar, it hands it off to another bee. And then that bee takes it up and puts it in the comb. But with pollen, bees don't waste any time. That bee that brings in the pollen doesn't hand it off, walks right up, puts it where it belongs, heads out for another load. They don't waste any time. Pollen is such a valuable resource. And there was so much that it was actually shaking out of the comb. And here, when I lifted up a comb, you can see it just fell out. Oh, yeah, and i just like to show a photo of a queen in late March. They're pretty. And the amount of brood that we had in late March. You know, that's impressive. I was happy with that. You know, because our goal is we want to build our bees up, and our goal is to have honey. So the faster we can build our bees up, the stronger we have our bees, the better the honey crop we can get. Yes, sir? Where do you live? I live down uh, between Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. Okay. Yeah, West Michigan. Same yeah. yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. How long does it take a willow tree to mature to the point where it starts to produce a significant amount of pollen? Well, I guess you'd have to define significant, but a pussy willow, even as a young tree, even at three to four feet, will begin to produce nectar and will continue its entire life. I just planted two willows along the waterway. Yeah, what kind were they? Willows. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a, uh, that's important. That, that's, all, that's all the tag said was willows. Okay, some of the hybrid willows, which are artificially hybridized, I've seen, bees don't touch them. I, I have actually noticed that uh, because we do install a lot of plants at my business that uh, one time we had to plant along a river walk willows, and they were a hybrid willow, and every year I go by them, and I've never seen a honeybee on them, ever. Whereas they're working the native willows very, very extensively. Uh, well, native willow would be Salix, S-A-L-I-X, Capria, C-A-P-R-E-A, Salix Capria, or Salix nigra, N-I-G-R-A. Those are two real common willows. S-A-L-I-X, Salix. There's Salix Capria. Yeah, if you buy a plant and it has an X in the middle of the name, generally I found bees don't like them as well. There are a 
couple exceptions, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But our goal is uh, to sell honey, right? I mean, that's what all this is about. That's why trees are important, because we want, to, we want our colonies to build up. They come through the winter, and we want them to get strong and build up and lay brood and be stimulated so that when the honey crop comes, they have the population to gather that nectar, bring it in, and make it into honey. So that's what it's all about. You know, we really, really want this, you know. There we are extracting honey. That's what it's all about. Now, I get asked a lot about other plants. What if you planted catmint? And I'm going to do a talk about that Saturday. What if we planted all these garden plants? Are they important? Well, in reality, this is uh, my wife's garden. In reality, this is really, really pretty. From a practical standpoint, I'm going to sound like I'm saying two things here. From a practical standpoint, all of these flowers might give what? A 30th of a teaspoon of honey? I mean, it's insignificant. It just doesn't matter to the hive in quantity. But it does keep the bees working between honey flows. We have, in the Midwest, we have a major source of nectar and honey coming in first thing in the spring, levels out, and then we have another major honey flow right now, levels out, and then we have one in the fall. We have three. We have three major honey flows. Between those honey flows, you've got a bunch of bees sitting around going, we don't have a lot to work on. And that's where these kinds of plants come in and are important because they tend, a lot of them are in bloom um, during those low periods of nectar flow. And uh, so this is absolutely good. And you will see bees all over things like catmint um, by the thousands. And so, yeah, these are all good too, but you're not going to get a honey crop off them. Cat mint and cat nip are two different plants, yes. That's Yeah, they'll work that also. Same, same concept, right. They, and they smell similar, but they are different plants. Yeah. yeah. So the ideal situation is to have an area, if you've got bees, is to have an area that has at least three plants, whether that be sweet clover, red maple, basswood, or, or you know, whatever else, fall plants, that yield surplus honey in considerable quantity. Yep, following that. And bloom at different periods. So that's the goal, is to have three different groups of plants that each produce a surplus of honey. One can be trees, one can be sweet clover or trees, and the third can be goldenrod, aster, whatever. Oh, fruit trees. Yeah, a wonderful source of, yeah. So after they flower, so I have apple trees. Sure. Do they start <coughs> that nectar off the leaves or the tree nope. afterwards? It's just when they flower. Just when they flower. And interesting point is that um, the flowers only produce nectar until they are adequately fertilized, especially flowers. I'm sorry, especially fruit. Um, for example, if you cut an apple open and count the seeds, if there are 10 seeds, it was properly pollinated. If you get eight or nine, it wasn't properly pollinated and it's probably smaller or slightly deformed. Same, and that same thing happens with uh, blueberries, strawberries, cucumbers. If every seed that can be pollinated is pollinated in that, in that flower, then the flower just shuts off. It stops producing nectar. Plants don't waste resources. They're not going to just keep putting out nectar without a, a need for it. You know, as soon as the job is done, they're fertilized, they're done producing nectar because that's an expensive, expensive resource that they have to expend. So that's the concept. We have three major honey flows going on in the Midwest. And we want maybe a few plants in between to keep the bees going. But uh, trees can be one or two of those major honey flows. Trees important in the Midwest. We'll just run through the list really quick. Um, I know we've all had lunch and it's afternoon and we're all tired. Me too. But I do want you to get this, you know, Elms, alders, you know, these are all 
important trees to have. And we'll kind of look at them, and there's your fruit tree down there. We'll kind of look at these. One tree that you never even consider is the elm. Elm trees, American elm especially, which is now gone, thanks to Dutch elm disease, used to be a major pollen-producing plant in Michigan. Amazing quantities of pollen that would come off of elm, early pollen. And for those of us who still know where there are some uh, American elms, you can go in early spring and they're just buzzing with bees. They're gathering that pollen and bringing it back. And that can be as early as mid-March. That's really early. And here you can see the buds off of an elm. Yep, this one happens to be Siberian elm. They, they have these basketball buds ready to open. And bees work them very, very well. Um, American elm, okay, I said mid-March. That would be the earliest, but uh, we'll see it often in late March, early April in full bloom. And remember, every city used to have an Elm Street. Every city does have an Elm Street because this is what they used to look like. One of the reasons we don't encourage planting a monoculture anymore, all the same species on a street, because if you get a disease, you've just eliminated all the trees on that street. And after these trees were taken down, it was a desert. Nothing. But... Um, Beautiful trees formed that canopy over streets in America back in the 50s, and then Dutch elm came. Dutch elm disease came in and wiped them out. And anecdotally, I have talked to some older beekeepers who said that the honey crops began to decrease as the elm population decreased. Whether there's a correlation there directly, I don't know, but it does make sense because we were getting a lot of early pollen. The bees were building up on it, and that would mean you'd have healthy, large colonies ready to take advantage of the, one of those honey flows. Yes? Do the bees work the new hybrid elms at all? I, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I have some of the new elms at my nursery that I'm growing. And I haven't noticed the bees on those yet. I have some that are about uh, 10 feet tall. And I haven't noticed the bees on them. No, those are not hybrids that I have. They're the uh, resistant strains. Yeah, so that's a good question. I'm not sure about that one. Alder, that's another one that people don't even know is out there. We have tag, tag alder, black alder. And again, they grow in the swamps. They grow with the willows. And, the, you know, the alder doesn't produce any nectar, but it does produce pollen, and it produces a lot of pollen. Um, here's some alders growing down, again, by my, by my farm, on the edge of a swamp, literally in the water, so you don't see them. And they have a potential of like 1,500 pounds of pollen per acre, and you can actually get an acre of alders growing in a swamp. It's a lot of pollen. It is not the most nutritious pollen, but it's a stimulant for the bees. They're out there gathering it. I'm sure you've all seen your bees in early spring. They're like gathering corn dust or, or sawdust, and they're looking for something to gather, and they'll go to the alders and gather that, and it actually stimulates brood production, gets them into their stored reserves, because then somehow they know spring is here, spring is coming. Um, and they don't make a bad landscape tree either. That's a European alder that uh, it's not a bad looking tree. I will plant these in cityscapes. Um, terminology I use is that city people, you know, the city fathers will give you a coffin to plant a tree in. And literally that's what it is. It's a coffin. It's, it's this crypt that they have filled with rubble and they want you to plant a tree in it and have the tree live. That'll live. That will live. And it is nitrogen fixing, so you don't have to worry about fertilizing it. It'll survive on little to no water. Uh, it, it's dark green all the time. Doesn't have any real serious pests besides aphids. And it grows fast. Fits all the criterion that a city wants. 
Just don't tell them it's an alder and don't tell them that it's good for the bees. You can tell them it's good for pollinators, but don't tell them it's good for the bees. And uh, then, of course, the red maple. It's a photo I took April 24th. Um, red maple already been in, been in bloom now for a month, and we still have red maples in bloom. That's an impressive plant. Here's another red maple. This is one of the cultivated varieties, or a cultivar. It's not a hybrid. It's a selected variety. And then it's grafted onto a rootstock. And look at the difference in color between those buds and those buds. And you'll see these planted like red sunset, um, October glory. Those are cultivars of red maples, marmo. And they all produce pollen and nectar that bees use. And there's a close-up of the flower. Amazing, the quantity. I want to talk about red maples real briefly and not bore you, but we have our native reds. Remember I said they're in bloom for five or six weeks. And this one might only be in bloom for a week, and then this one's in bloom for a week, and this one's in bloom for a week. And that's dependent upon microclimates, partly. He's in Chicago in town. So he gets warm earlier, red maples open earlier. I might be out on a farm, top of a hill. That one's going to be a little bit later. Genetically, there's a lot of variation. You can take seeds from the same maple and, and plant them, and one will bloom a week before the other. So there's a lot of genetic variation, microclimate variations. And then we have over 200 different cultivars of red maple in the nursery industry. Like I said, the red sunset, the marmo. Etc. and they all can bloom a little different, different times. Now the most popular red maple sold in America today is a Freeman maple, Autumn Blaze. They are a hybrid. They are a cross between a red maple and a silver maple. And they take the best habits of both, fast growth of the silver, dependability and stability of the red and they've crossed them together, they've come up with a Freeman maple. So anytime you see this designation, Freeman X something, it doesn't matter what. My experience is the bees work them like crazy. And they're a good quality maple. So if you see those in the garden center, don't be afraid to buy them. That's one hybrid I'm not afraid to buy. Um, sugar maple, sugar maples bloom, it, it's, uh, Bees work them, but they're only in bloom for a couple of days. That's a real kicker. And there's, there's sugar maple in bloom. Look at all those blossoms. A couple of days later, they're all gone. They are generally wind pollinated. Well, they are wind pollinated, but bees will still work them and gather pollen and nectar. When we get into the cherries, uh, lots of different kinds of cherries. And... Uh, Pin cherry, black cherry, choke cherry, wild sweet cherry, fruit cherries, ornamental cherries. I have discovered as I drive around that we have this phenomenon, and it's not in any of the tree books, and I've looked. I'm a tree guy. I'm an arborist. I'm always in the tree books. I am seeing everywhere clusters of these white sweet cherries. And just to the uninitiated, the pe people will drive by and think, well, that must be a black cherry or something, oh, um, they're not. They are a sweet cherry, a domestic sweet cherry that a bird has eaten, gone and sat on a tree somewhere, sat on a fence post, added a little fertilizer and planted it. And I am seeing so many of these things around. I was telling a, an arborist friend about it. He called me the other day and he said, you know, I've been looking for those. And he said, I didn't even know they were out there, but they produce a sweet cherry about that big, and they're good. And he said, this arborist friend of mine said that he had put, picked over a bushel of sweet cherries. Free, free, you know, and they're out there everywhere. You don't see any mention of them in the tree books. But Kalamazoo County, Allegan County, where I tend to do most of my work, Kent County, I see hundreds of these things, fence rows, um, I was at a Menards, and they had a whole line of these things that I could just see. The birds had sat and 
plopped one down every few feet. So I kind of make a note and go back and harvest the cherries. They're very good. Yep, there's another one. Look at, and I did take this one out of Menards. This photo I took at Menards in Kalamazoo. Edge of their parking lot. They didn't know they had a treat there. Was spraying, I was spraying trees uh, for the city of Allegan the other day, and I'm going, this is wonderful because they had blackberries and they had wild sweet cherries like this, and I was just having a feast. And people were jogging by. They didn't even know this food was there. So I was real happy. And this makes the bees happy. So I'm encouraged by these. Probably someone's going to find out they're out there. They're going to call them invasive, and we're going to have to cut them all down. But, you know, this is a, uh, an ornamental cherry. This is a snow fountain cherry. Bees like it, especially the, uh, the wild bees, solitary bees. They really like this. And you'll... You'll see hundreds, if not thousands, of solitary bees on the ornamental cherry. Here's one that's kind of a deceiver. This is a Juneberry, and I have never, ever seen a honeybee on Juneberry, personally. Never have. And it's listed in the books as being a good source of nectar. I've never seen it. Yes, sir? You think so? I... I'll have to test that theory. Um, you, see them, you see them three deep in Connecticut. In Connecticut. I, I looked at some of the old uh, uh, Pellet. Pellet has a book on uh, wildflowers, honey plants. It's out of print now. Dadance used to publish it. And I was looking in there. And he, his, he says that bees will work this north of the United States. And maybe what you're saying is right, acid soil. But you've seen it. I told, uh, was telling Randy Slochter about that. He's a friend of mine. He's in the uh, Holland Club. And being a smart aleck, he sent me this photo. There's a bee on a Juneberry. And I give him proper credit. And then I said, I, I need to know details. I want details. Don't just send me a bee. Maybe the bee was tired. I don't know. And the, the reality is, probably from me to that Juneberry away, he started a field, a, a apiary of 50 colonies of bees. Well, of course there's a bee on it. You know, if he'd have put a, if he'd have put a stump out there, there would have been a bee on it. But uh, that's interesting what you say about acid soil. I'll have to check that out. Red bud, you know, bees work them profusely. And red buds are beautiful. They're good ornamental. They'll grow in sun or shade. Um, they have some issues as far as a habitat. In the trade, we call them dead buds because they're hard to get going. They're hard to transplant. The first year they're transplanted, they often die back to the ground. But um, years ago, they stopped growing commercially. They stopped growing red buds in Michigan because they grow so much faster out west or they grow so much faster in Tennessee. So they use the Tennessee stock, they grow it up into a tree, ship it into Michigan, and we wonder why it dies. So I take red buds, I go to native red buds that are growing, and I do winter cuttings, and about 50% of them survive, and then I line them out. And that's where I get my red buds. I do the same with dogwoods. You know, from a domestic source, it's called provenance. You can't take a red maple from Maine and have it live in Michigan. You can't take a red maple from Florida. I'm sorry. You can't take it from Maine and have it live in Florida. You can't take it from Florida and have it live in Maine, but it's still the same genus species. You know, they just have this local provenance going. They have adapted to their area. And I think red buds and dogwoods are the same way. Get one that's locally grown propagate from it, and you're going to have a lot better chance of success. But it's a lot harder. It takes more time to do that. I had a friend in, uh, uh, he's in Oregon. I was telling the story earlier, and he's, he uh, grew trees in Grand Haven, Michigan. And he moved to Oregon to grow trees. And he said to me one day, he said, why would you ever grow trees in Michigan? 
You know, he can get six, seven foot of growth per year in his trees. It takes me three years to get that much or four. I've got some apples that are six or seven years old and they're only now this big. You know, he would do that in one growing season. Now, why do we grow trees in Michigan? Um, Eastern red bud, really pretty flower. Black locust. Now, this, this one always gets the ire of a few people in the room because black locust is considered a junk tree. Farmers were paid to plant it, and then they were paid to take it out because it can take over. It can spread. It can put up suckers and take over a field. But um, here are two that I planted at a hardware store. And look at that. We don't have any suckers. We don't have any issues at all because they're mowed around. And the suckers are kept under control, and they're a beautiful landscape plant. Better yet, look at the flowers on those things. And according to the literature, they have a potential of 1,500 pounds per acre. If you had an acre of black locusts, you could get, if you had the bees, you could get 1,500 pounds of honey. Black locusts, you love them or you hate them. I love them. Keep them confined, and they're a fantastic tree. Don't keep them confined, and you've got to run away from them because they'll chase you. But they're just, just a beautiful flower. Here is an example of what happens if you don't mow. I think this is one tree. I think that there was an original tree, and it suckered before they put in the, this development, and you're looking at one tree. That's what they can do. But you know what? You'll end up with an acre of black locusts that way. They're beautiful, though. And then, of course, fruit trees, great source of nectar and pollen. That, that goes without saying. And not only the fruit trees, but anything in that fruit family, like the flowering crabs. Um, bees love them. Bees are all over them. And it's a good, nutritious nectar and a good, nutritious pollen. So it's all around a good, a good plant to have. And if you vary your species, if you have different kinds of apples going and flowering crabs, you can extend that season and make it last for several weeks. And another thing about crab apples is that they're a multi-purpose tree. You know, not only are they pretty, but they provide food for birds and animals. Another one to talk about is tulip poplar. Um, the leaf is shaped like a tulip, and it has kind of a, well, it has a tulip flower. Um, flowers are at the top of the tree, and again, I was telling somebody that there are new cultivars developed that you don't have to wait until this tree is 25 years old before it produces. Um, there are new cultivars that start producing at a young age, and they're just now coming on the market, and I fully intend to get some. Here's a tulip tree. If you grow them around other trees where they're seeking the sun, they will grow straight and tall. And this tree is over 100 feet tall. Probably, what, 75 foot to the first branch? I have one on my property that I, uh, I cut down a year ago, two years ago. Beautiful straight wood, had it cut up into lumber and made beehives out of it. It was, you know, beautiful lumber. And I made some bookshelves and a desk and that kind of stuff. Uh, desk, yeah, desktop. Beautiful wood, and the bees love them. Here you can see the residue of one of the flowers. After the flower is gone, they leave behind this pot. Um, they will produce nectar before the flower so that there's nectar in these little nectaries around the flower. I should probably go back so that bees are working and coming to that plant, gathering nectar right down here, and then the flower opens and the bees are there. Catalpa does the same thing. Black gum does the same thing. There are several trees that'll do that. Bees are already coming before the flower opens. Pretty interesting, I think. Autumn olive, truly invasive. It's taken over the world. We were encouraged to plant it for wildlife. Now we're encouraged to take it out. But I'll tell you what, it produces honey. Bees love it. 
And whether you love it or hate it, it's here, it's probably here to stay. And the bees like it. And when these are in bloom in late May, it, it smells fantastic. And they're another one, the birds. Birds really like them, but what they didn't tell us was that the birds do like the cherry. They take it, add a little bit of fertilizer, and plant them everywhere. And they all germinate. But autumn olive, really pretty flower. Smells really nice. Um, look at the sumacs. This one is smooth sumac. They bloom in June, generally. And uh, great source of uh, nectar. I have had my bees uh, make frames of honey off sumac. I don't, I don't want to say a super, but they will go out, and when the sumacs are in bloom, they work it just furiously and bring it back. Some people like sumac honey, some people don't. It can be kind of dark, it can be kind of flavorful, we'll put it. Sumac in bloom. This is smooth sumac. And, you know, I think they have an interesting winter look. And if you wonder if a sumac makes a good landscape plant, right outside this building, go down into the uh, atrium, go out onto, I'm disoriented, but if you go out the loading dock, someone's planted one as a landscape plant. It's like the locust. They keep mowing around it. It's mowed around, and it's a beautiful landscape plant. Something to consider, and the bees love it. Of course, we can use the, uh, the sumac bobs in our smokers. How many of you do that? If you've been a beekeeper very long, you probably do. It makes a real calming smoke for the bees. Here's another sumac that you may not have considered. This is the fragrant sumac. And I took this photo, I think, in Maine at um, Cabela's, and they use it in these parking islands. Indestructible. Beautiful red fall color. And fragrant when crushed and the bees work it in, oh, mid-April, mid to late April. So that's another sumac. Yes, sir? Does it cut itself off with that light? It, it tends to grow up and then fall over and then kind of spread. It's, uh, this is one of the cultivars called Grow Low. And, you know, you can buy them that grow real low to the ground, or you can just use the species, which will mound up a little higher than this. But it's a good sumac. We can put sumac out in the landscape for the bees and the other pollinators, and you know, the landscapers will appreciate it. You know, we can encourage this kind of thing. That looks good. It's very nice looking, and it's just absolutely fire red in the fall, like a burning bush in color. So people like them. This is a, uh, a linden. This is a little leaf linden. This is one of my customers. And uh, they have a love-hate relationship with this tree because right there is their swimming pool behind this artwork. And if you're familiar with little leaf lindens, they have that tongue and they have you know, the seeds that come down. And fortunately, the man, the husband, loves this tree. She hates it. And she would just as soon I cut it down. And uh, boy, there's no way. No way. It's a beautiful tree. Get a close up. This is, uh, this is that same tree in bloom. Another linden that we have uh, is a silver linden. Silver linden was in the news a couple years ago, wrongly, I might say. Uh, but I'll get to that in a moment. Notice the underside of the leaf. Good way to tell. This one blooms late. It's not in bloom yet. We're at what? The 11th or so of July? And it's not in bloom yet. Maybe in a week it'll be in bloom. So if we use basswoods, we could have European basswood, American basswood, silver basswood, or silver linden. And we've now extended that blooming season into a month. So that's one of the techniques that, that I like to use. Uh, silver linen was in the news because it got accused of killing a bunch of bumblebees. Um, allegedly, 
the nectar from silver lindens is poisonous to bees. That's based on a study done back in 1950s in Germany where somebody found a bunch of bumblebees dead underneath a silver linden. And it's one of those urban myths, I believe. I have read everything. I found the original German report translated into English. And there's been no verification that I can find since that silver linden nectar is poisonous or harms bees. My bees work it. I've never seen a dead bee under silver linden. What I think may happen is that silver linden is used as a sedative. You make it into a tea. It contains a, uh, a chemical that uh, calms you down. Name escapes me right now. No, 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 no. That, that one calms you down for good. But I kind of wonder if when they found those bumblebees underneath the tree, I wonder if they were sleeping. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Maybe they were just napping it off. I don't know. But that, that study or that report has been repeated, and you find it everywhere. You find it in the literature. Maybe poisonous to bees. I, is it? I see no evidence of it. And I, I just, so I just tell people, plant silver linden. They're a great street tree. They, they look nice, and they don't get Japanese beetles because they have hairs on the underside of their leaves, and Japanese beetles won't feed on them. So I like them. All right, and now that those are the major trees, we have some others. We're almost out of time. I'll go through these quickly. Catalpa, if you're familiar with catalpa, that's another one that produces nectar before it produces flowers. Big leaf and the flower is absolutely gorgeous. Look at that. It's just like an orchid. Downside, these pods, these bean pods. They'll form these. It's a legume. It, it uh, fixes its own nitrogen in the soil. And because it's a legume, it has pea pods. Peas are legumes. Beans are legumes. And they form these pea pods, the seeds, and they drop on the ground. That's the drawback to one of those. Washington hawthorn. If you look carefully, this was at the guy's house with the linden tree. Can you see? Yep, there's a bee. Really, really worked hard. The drawback is they have these thorns that will kill you. They have thorns that will kill you. And they grow up the stem. Interesting, they're only on the bottom part of the tree. Get to the top of the tree and you'll find no thorns. Only at the bottom, and I think that's to keep critters from crawling up in there to do what they're going to do. Uh, I've pruned a lot of these things, and they're nasty. They are really nasty. There is a thornless variety um, of Washington hawthorn, and I just don't think they're hardy. I've, I've tried to use them. They don't have the bloom of a regular Washington hawthorn. Poplar. Some years can be significant in terms of uh, pollen. I mean, look at it hanging there. Bees, bees will work it. The advantage of a poplar is that, is that I have seen them in bloom when there's snow on the ground. And I have photographs of them with snow on the ground in bloom. So if a bee makes it out, it's going to be gathering that. This is another tree that I like to promote. This, uh, this is a variety that I planted uh, in the city of Otsego. And it's uh, Machia, and this is in this is in uh, uh, late July, early August. Look at the flower on that. Bees like it. Don't know much about it in terms of potential honey yet, or potential nectar. But what I do know is that when it's in bloom, the bees are all over it. Again, when I sell this to a municipality, I say we're going to put in a pollinator-friendly plant. Oh, everybody on city council is just, yeah, yeah, save the pollinators. They're thinking butterflies. Don't mention bees or you won't get the contract. I took this photo last week, Chinese chestnut. Um, good substitute for the American chestnut. And it looks, the leaves look very similar. This was in bloom. I don't know, if can you see the honeybee on it right there? 
Bees were cloud overneath this tree, or over this tree. I was pretty impressed by it. July 1st in bloom. And they have an edible nut. This is a buckeye. Um, I got to kind of hurry up here. Red chestnut. Good landscape tree. Uh, I, I said buck nut. Yeah, buckeye. Thank you. It's been a long day. Buckeye. And red chestnut, which is related. This is a hybrid variety. We talked about hybrids. This is one called Fort McNair. And the bees love it. Um, this is one in my yard. And I just, I just, I use them all the time. I use them every chance somebody will let me plant one. Because the bees love them. They're hardy. They're disease resistant. And they're, they're beautiful. Horse chestnut, you know, bees like them. Um, tell you a real quick story. We were working, this is my crew. We were working at a McDonald's pruning these crab apples. And next door, they were taking down a gas station. And I just show this anecdotally because I knew these guys who were taking down the trees. They're going to expand the gas station. And uh, here they are working. And on the corner of the property is this huge tulip popple, over 100 feet tall. And there it is when they were done. Here's the tree. This gal was working for me. She's up against this tree. There was no reason to take that tree down, none. And I talked to the guys, and I said, I want to talk to the manager of this project. It was in the corner. It wasn't hurting a thing. And I should do a, have a follow-up photo. They, they put in three blue spruce where this thing was. They took down a 100-foot pollinating or pollen-producing and nectar-producing tree for no reason, just because the orders that these guys had were fence to fence, take out all the trees. So they did. They took down this beautiful tree and replaced it, and there it is. There's the spot right there. Oh, man, I can't stand that. The other thing I'm seeing is that as the price of corn goes up, um, Farmers are having to irrigate. And I know it's down right now, which gives them even more incentive to grow more corn because they have to grow more to get the same money. Um, more and more of these irrigation things are going in. This was a guy I worked for, and he was taking out his fence rows. Fence rows that consisted of cherry and basswood and elm, all the things that bees like, taking them out because he's got to put in a pivot irrigation because those are expensive. He put in 12 of them two years ago. Hasn't used them since, which is kind of funny. Um, as a beekeeper, what can you do? I think that as beekeepers, we need to learn what's out there. What's in your area? What are the bees working? It's like that guy up, I won't tell you where, I almost did. It's like that beekeeper who didn't know that his bees were getting honey from a basswood tree. He had no knowledge. I'm trying to educate you. Trees are necessary. And you need to plant appropriate trees. And by that I mean if your choice is between, again, a basswood or a Norway maple, go with a basswood. If it's between a, uh, you know, a, uh, a black gum or uh, you know, some other kind of tree that everybody has, a crimson king maple, plant the black gum. Think outside the box. Think of trees that will be attractive to pollinators, not just honeybees but attractive to pollinators. And if you are in any way on a tree board or if you have any influence on the municipality, say, hey, quit planting all one variety and let's start planting different varieties, different species. Let's, let's mix it up a little bit here and you can kind of push those pollinator-friendly trees. I like tree lilacs. They're a great one. Bees work them. They'll be in bloom for four weeks. Yes, sir? <coughs> No, no, they're wind pollinated. No, I mean, they're good for other things, but not that. So consider multi-use trees. The crab apple, nice flowers, nice fruit, good for the wildlife. Um, so think outside. I tell my customers, don't plant a burning bush, plant a blueberry. Same fall color, except you get blueberries off it too. And it's better for the bees. Um, encourage and maintain habitat. And I tell all my customers, I say, try to develop a 10% attitude. I have a customer who I said, you know, 
I think in this corner of your property we could put in some milkweeds. And she said, okay. So we planted it all in milkweeds, and I'm converting the trees on that property to pollinator-friendly trees. As one dies and we have to replace it, I'm putting in something that the bees like. That's the attitude we have to have as beekeepers. You know, it, it's a lot easier to plant a tree than it is to plant half an acre of sweet clover. So that's what I want you to take away with you today. Think of the trees.